Wow, amazing. A very auspicious occasion today. It's a watershed moment. Quality of presentations have been amazing, but they're from the heart. And that's what made them so passionate and so powerful in so many ways. And I'm standing up and saying, I'm supposed to follow this? Oh, no. OK, well, here we go. Um, what? Oh, ah, it is there. Uh, right, that's me, and that's what we're doing. Right. Um, the, the world of emotions is hell for those with autism. That is, aut um, emotions within you and in other people. We've had descriptions of the power of the emotions within you, but it's also in other people too. And the problem can be within the person is the strength of those emotions. This is a quote. If something happens to make me happy or upset, then I quickly become extremely happy or upset. I don't have many intermediate states, and I find it almost impossible to moderate my internal emotional response. Whereas new neurotypicals will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Here's one, two, three, eight, nine, ten. <laughs> and it seems that anything that should have been four, five, six comes out as that intensity. And when I talk to people with autism about that, and it's very real. It's not a fake when they are feeling despondent and suicidal. It's not a fake. It's not necessarily attention-seeking. It is a very powerful and intense emotion. And throughout that person's day and life, they are experiencing very intense emotions, which is absolutely exhausting. But there's another dimension, and that is emotional sensitivity. There is a terrible error in understanding autism to say a lack of empathy which is a huge insult to some of the kindest people I know as friends, colleagues, and family members. There is great caring. But I think there is a difference here that needs to be recognized. And this is being overly sensitive to another person's negative mood, infected by it. And it's almost as though somebody's in a negative mood, an equivalent level of a cold. But the person with autism gets infected by it, but they don't get a cold, they get the flu. And sometimes, I'm, I'm really angry, sad, anxious. Where did this come from? What in my life has happened that will justify this emotional reaction? No, nothing's happened. You've just been with someone that is having that feeling. So it's not just simply the emotions within you, it's emotions within other people too and especially sensitive to negative moods of disappointment, anxiety, or agitation. And that person picks it up, and it really does disrupt their day. We call this empathic attunement. These are further quotes. There's a kind of instant subconscious reaction to the emotional states of other people that I've understood better in myself over the years, but it's been there since childhood. If someone approaches me for a conversation and they are full of worry, fear, or anger, I find myself suddenly in the same state of emotion. And this means that sometimes social withdrawal is not necessarily due to social confusion or sensory sensitivity. The withdrawal is a protection mechanism from being with toxic others with emotionality. And as we had... From Yen, a moment ago, I do all that I can to keep those with autism out of psychiatric hospitals, especially adolescent psychiatric hospitals, because it really is hell for that person in terms of the emotionality of other people. Quote, I'm able to distinguish very subtle cues that others would not see, or it might be a feeling I pick up from them. What neurotypicals do is they tend to use the visual and auditory. The visual is the facial expression and gesture. The auditory is the tone of voice. Now, in autism, you have a different sensory profile. And I think this is in a sixth sense sensitivity. And he's able to pick up emotions in other people using channels that neurotypicals aren't aware of that are accurate Definitely accurate. Trust your intuition there, but can be overpowering. It's a sixth sense. So you avoid some social situations due to being sensitive to negative vibes. And this is my excuse. 
I'm a great fan of Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. And he wrote the song Good Vibrations, and that's a picture of him at the time that he did. Happens to be at San Diego Zoo in uh, February 1966. Not that I remember anything exactly about that, but I can tell you all the details about it, and uh, he's one of my heroes since I was 14 and so on. Anyway, and that encyclopedic knowledge certainly can help you. Um, so... But you also have not only that sensitivity to mood in others, but when somebody says, how are you feeling? Then the person with autism says, I don't know. What do you mean, you don't know? You can tell me about quantum physics. You can tell me about drain covers. You know every horse variation you can think of. How can you not know what you're feeling? No, I don't know. Well, what were you feeling when you had a meltdown? I don't know. I'm now going to complete the sentence. I don't know how to grasp one of the many thoughts or feelings swirling in my mind. Hold one, identify it, and explain it in speech so that you will understand it. The emotions are there. Oh, yes, in a rich vocabulary and variety of emotions. But converting thought and emotion to speech is a real problem. Now, when Michelle and I were doing our depression programs and we were asking the group, um, can you tell us what's going on in your mind? What are your thoughts and feelings for depression? And we found that the major causes of depression were bullying and teasing from other people and the seeds of low self-esteem were planted by the predators or depression due to exhaustion from the amount of mental energy to cope with your day. More on that in a moment. But we said to the guys, okay, we just, Michelle and I just decided, okay, we'll do this. And we had no idea how the reaction was going to be. We said, okay, between now and next week, could you create a playlist of music that in the songs or the lyrics, it perfectly describes your feelings? <laughs> Great. Go to Google Images type in sad. You'll have 500 images of sadness. Choose the five images that represent your feelings. You are a great fan of Harry Potter and Dementors, which are really depression <laughs> sucking out your happiness. Choose a scene in a Harry Potter novel that describes your sadness. You are a great fan of Star Wars movies. Choose a scene in a Star Wars movie that describes your feelings. And what I found with girls and women with autism, is that their career may be the arts, but the arts enable them to express the self and their inner world of emotions and experiences through art. They sometimes sing in perfect pitch, which is a bit of a problem, actually, because I saw uh, at the clinic the other day a woman of 24 who's remarkably good in uh, music, and her mother was sitting next to her, and her mother said, oh, yes, the two of us like to sing. And her daughter said, no, I hate singing with you. You're off key. <laughs> and I said, could you not join a local choral society? No, they can't sing. <laughs> and she's got perfect pitch and things like that. But it's also the artwork. I went to a, um, an exhibition recently, um, and I was looking at the paintings, and I said, and the one painting just froze me because I thought, that's autism. Whoever painted that has autism. So I talked to the gallery owner and I said, who was the person who painted? And the, the, when she went, I thought, yes, you can just spot that autistic quality in the painting. It's, Michelle, you've not seen it, but I'll show you one day. It's absolutely brilliant. So it's an eloquence in poetry. It can be in typing. It can be anything else but look at me and tell me. And that's what psychologists and psychiatrists need to know. Converting thought and emotion to speech isn't the easy thing for that person to do. So it may well be that I think in the future we need to encourage in this area art and music, art therapy and music therapy as a way of exploring and expressing the self. But there's another way, and I was talking to an adult recently, and <clears throat> she was saying, I only know what I feel by seeing what I'm doing. 
There's that mind-body division. Now, what about happiness and enjoyment? Often through the special interest. It's the great joy of life. My emotional range is quite extreme and somewhat rudimentary. However, <laughs> when I engage in my special interest on my own, I can access a greater emotional realm and landscape that is wonderful and safe for me in that context. So for the person with autism, their greatest euphoric moment may be related to their special interest. may not be interpersonal, may not involve another person, but it is the excitement of discovering something new in your interest. It's different. It's not wrong. It's finding things in life that others don't see or understand and joy in life that others may not see or understand. But one of the problems can be with those intense emotions, especially negative emotions, is that thermometer can be a bit of a problem, especially in childhood, because you may have a degree of agitation from zero to 10. Neurotypical in, should we say, trying to solve a problem, their level of agitation and thinking may be, okay, I can't do it, I'll try another way. No, it doesn't work. I'll keep going. No, no, I'll be flexible. I'll be accommodating. I'll try another way. I'll get there eventually. Level five out of 10, solved it. Great. Autism. I can't, get it! And I go to number 10. <laughs> and then the teacher says, come on, have another go. Are you mad woman? That nearly killed me. So it means in your daily life, you have a minefield that you walk through of creating intense emotions, and they just explode and destroy your happiness in many ways. Now, when we're working on emotions, then there are six standard emotions we will work on. Yes, there is a high level of depression. 75 to 85% of those with an autism spectrum disorder are prone to being sad. Sometimes a clinical depression can be anxious. Oh, yeah, one thing that those with autism are very good at, worrying. And sometimes anger. But actually, when we analyze why is the anger occurring, it's either depression that goes into not self-blame, but an externalized agitated depression. You go into attack mode. But when you look at that person's life, they're very depressed. But rather than blaming themselves, it's a lack of respect and going externally. Or the anger is due to anxiety and being frustrated from access to strategies to alleviate your stress and anxiety. And that leads to anger. So although in autism, there may be a high level of anger, when it comes to treatment, often the underlying emotion is depression or anxiety. But as clinicians, we have to work on the positive emotions in autism as well, happiness. And there can be in autism a difficulty resonating with the happiness of others. It's almost as though in terms of intensity and types of emotions, if a person has negative emotions, um, really disliking that in other people because you pick it up not know how to respond and so on, but also feeling uncomfortable with positive emotions and not knowing how to resonate with the euphoria of other people. And the tragedy is, in autism, you can be infected by negative mood, but not infected by being jollied up. And come on, yeah, look, come on, borrow my energy, yeah. No, it doesn't work. It's almost like a one-way system. The negative emotions, yeah, you get those but not necessarily infected by the positive emotions. Neurotypicals need to realize that. Works for them, but not necessarily autism. Another difficulty in autism is, come on, just relax. Just, just, just relax. Just relax. Relax. I don't know how to. Just relax. Come on, just give it a try. No idea. But also affection. And sometimes it's not a hug, it's a squeeze. And why are you squeezing me? And how does squeezing me solve the problem? And when the child is young, you learn don't cry, because if you cry, people squeeze you. <laughs> so there can be a major issue. For neurotypicals, uh, affection is the fastest, most effective way of emotionally being restored. Here, no, you are invading my personal body space. When I talk to teenagers with autism, 
as I did this week with a group of teenagers who are concerned about their anxiety. And I said, when you're anxious, what do you want your parents to do? Leave me alone. Don't go near me. Don't ask what's the problem. I don't want to talk. Don't say anything. Don't hug me. Don't invade my personal body space. Now, the problem for neurotypicals is they try and do what works for them. And they need to know that Aspergerese or autism is a different culture. So you have a different way of emotional repair. Otherwise, neurotypicals are making it worse inadvertently in doing that. So there are problems with emotional arousal for both negative and positive emotions. Over the years, I've developed these programs, and this one, Exploring Feelings for Anxiety, with my name on it, but Michelle, your name should be on it too, because we did this together years ago. But my apologies for that, but it, it should, <laughs> it should, should have, have your name on it. Okay? Anyway, it's very good, and I recommend it. Um, <laughs> I also did one for anger, which should have Michelle's name on it too, because <laughs> we spent ages working on this and doing the programmes. So that's one for anger as well. But at last, I learned my lesson. And this one has both our names on it. And this is to explain to those with autism why neurotypicals are obsessed with affection. And they are obsessed with it. And they need to be told they're loved and hugged every day. And I say, you have to feel sorry for neurotypicals. They're such fragile flowers. <laughs> they have to be nurtured and loved and looked after every day. You are a cactus. <laughs> With a prickly exterior, because you have such a soft and vulnerable interior, you keep people away because they hurt emotionally. So you live successfully some distance from other cacti. The amount of affection water is one cup a month. And you're okay. But your mum or your partner is a rose in a rose garden that needs to be mulched and nurtured every day. You just have to feel sorry for them because they need that all the time. It's exhausting, but you've got to remember to give them two compliments a day. <laughs> right. So we have a program there on demystifying affection, but also explaining to parents and partners why the person with autism shows love and affection, but it might be in a different way. It's not less, but it's just a different way of showing love. Now, sometimes with that difficulty of being in touch with your body, we have new technology which can be incredibly helpful. And that's sports technology. Fitbits, for example. In autism, there can be a mind-body division. And often the mind is not aware of the body. For example, in uh, Michelle and I, one of our teenage girl groups, we were talking about that sensory sensitivity and so on. Several of the girls out of eight said, when I'm ill, I don't know in advance when I'm going to vomit. I am going along and saying, where everyone else, oh, oh, I'll get to the toilet. You have all the antecedents to go. Here, it just happens, and you're not aware of the physiology of your body to be prepared for those components. Now, that means that when you are agitated, whether you are anxious or angry, you are going to increase your heart rate. And if you're not aware of that, we need technology of sports devices, of increasing signs of agitation. For those parents who may be tuned into this, this also means when your daughter goes to school and she's a goody two-shoes and perfect, but when she gets home, she's dreadful. And parents will say, I wish she was like she is at school at home because they like that person who's very calm and so on. What you may have is then a measure of heart rate throughout the day. And you have it on a graph. And that can give data, evidence to the teacher that when you had a surprise test, she nearly lost it. Or when there was a replacement teacher in, when there was a transition even to a preferred activity, heart rate, boom, boom, boom. And what you find in autism is there are certain triggers, and it may be they can cope with three, but on the fourth, they lose it. If you only go one, two, three, I'm okay, I'm okay. But as soon as you hit the fourth, that's it, it's broken. But it also can teach you relaxation of sitting still, comfortably, looking at the numbers and concentrating on your breathing and thinking to make the numbers fall. So I don't have 
um, shares in Fitbits, but I find they're really good. <laughs> now, as an illustration of the mind-body division, this is of an adult male with autism, but I think this would go for females equally. Michelle and I were doing a diagnostic assessment of an adult in his 60s. Engineer, self-made man, uh, very successful career. And he was seen with his wife. And his wife said, I'm sure he has autism, Asperger's, but they didn't know about it when he was a child. But as I've discovered more about it, I think this is my husband. And lo and behold, yes, indeed. In his 60s, classic residual autism. So I decided in our conversation to talk to him about the life stages of someone with autism, primary school, high school, etc. And he said, Tony, you are describing events in my life I've never told anyone because I don't want to be thought of as mad or stupid or defective. I've hidden it. But you have given me a rationalization. It's like a 5,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. You've suddenly shown me the cover of the box. It all makes sense. This was a road to Damascus experience. It was just a revelation for him. Tears were welling in his eyes and about to cascade down his cheeks. I could see them, Michelle could see them, and his wife could see them. And his wife leant to the tissue box, pulled out a tissue and handed it to him. And he went, how did you know I was going to cry? We could tell by the context, we could see the tears, but he was the last to be aware of his emotional state, which all means all behavior modification mechanisms won't work. If you're not cognitively aware, how can you use cognitive behavior therapy? Major problems. And this is why I want psychotherapy designed by Aspies, for Aspies, administered by Aspies. Okay. Because otherwise it's neurotypical. Look at me and tell me all your feelings. And the person goes, no! Yo, oh, you're just being non-compliant. You're not taking this therapy seriously. So I think there needs to be. And I have found through the years, because one of the characteristics of autism in girls can be to observe, analyze, and imitate, to look for patterns, that they became a psychologist at three years old. And they discovered patterns and interactions that aren't in the psychology textbooks because they're written by neurotypicals. And that's why I think those with autism can be very successful, not only in technology and in the arts, but the caring professions. Absolutely. And the most caring people I know. When I see teenagers saying, I think with autism, I, th I think I I'd like to be a psychologist. But I, and I go, great, good on you. Go for it, because we need more of you, because you know you have credibility, you need to explore it, but design a therapy for those who share the same characteristics. We also know that there can be, uh, how shall I put it, tides of autism. For a parent, when your daughter wakes up, comes into the kitchen, you look in her eyes and go, oh dear, autistic day. <laughs> You say, right, she's emotionally fragile, socially withdrawn, intellectual fog, oh dear. Walks into class, the teacher looks at her and goes, uh, library at lunchtime. No surprise tests, etc. And the tide of autism has come in. Now that level of autism may be totally different to when that child went to sleep. And they wake up with a tide of autism. Something happens or doesn't happen in sleep that can affect the expression and severity of autism. So what we need to do is check the tides of autism by a mood diary or an autism level diary. So it may be that uh, mum's looking at that uh, chart and talks to the um, primary school teacher on a Friday afternoon and says to her, according to the charts, next uh, week she's going to be fine Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, she's going to be a bit iffy, and Friday, next week, she's going to be suspended. <laughs> so she's not going to go to school on Friday. Can you give me her work for Friday on Thursday so she can do it at home? Otherwise, she'll have a notoriety. She can't cope with the academic and the social curriculum. What people need to realise... 
those with autism work at school and in the work environment twice as hard as anybody else because they're doing the social and the cognitive. Now, we have a number of excellent publications. I'm going to do a promotion for this because Danuta, friend and colleague, who's based in Melbourne, has written an excellent book. She has a clinic in Melbourne called Unique You, which is for those with autism, girls and women. And she has a, a remarkable expertise. Also, Rudy Simone and Asper Girls, one of the first books that came out, beautifully written. There are other books by Karen McKibben, a clinical psychologist in the, based in the United States. But she's done a huge survey of hundreds of women with autism throughout the world and come out with some particular patterns and ideas. For professionals, I strongly recommend this book. Also... Oh dear. As a clinician, my concern isn't autism. Not at all. No. It's different. Different way of perceiving, thinking, learning and relating. You found something more interesting in life than socialising. That's who you are. That's great. My concern is neurotypicals who can't tolerate anyone who's different and they have fun targeting anyone who's different. And for teenage girls and women, these are male predators of not reading the signals, not understanding appropriate places, and so on. Leanne holiday Willie, who wrote Pretending to be Normal, has written a subsequent book called Safety Skills for Asperger Women. It's ideas and strategies to spot male predators. Because unfortunately, many of the women that I see have been in very unfortunate situations. One of them that uh, Leanne had was she was in Texas, very hot day, very hot. She wanted some air conditioning, so she went into a bar to cool down. And she was sitting at a table on her own, and there was a guy at the bar itself came up to her and said, are you hot? To which she said, yeah, I'm really hot. But she had no idea that there are two meanings for hot. As far as she was concerned, it was her body temperature, not her interest in sex. So you can get all sorts of confusion. Another book is by Debbie Brown. The Aspie Girl's Guide to Being Safe with Men. The unwritten rules nobody is telling you. So we have to teach them the dark side of neurotypicals. They're not all as nice as you. And those with autism tend to take people by what they say, not their character. Not by that built-in radar to spot they're not nice. Michelle and I have written uh, a book on depression for teens and adults. It's a self-help book, but that can be used not just with a psychologist, but at home with someone who may be able to support you because we lose them. There are some for whom they say, I can't cope with this any longer. They have a depression attack and I'm out of here. Well, I have one woman that I know who's uh, married to a wonderful husband and her special interest is horses. <laughs> and actually she said, her husband was sitting next to her. She said, yeah, I think I love horses more than my husband. <laughs> it's true. Uh, and she gets depressed, and she got so depressed one day, she said, I'm going to hang myself. That's it. I can't cope with it any longer. I'm going to hang myself. So she went around the farm looking for a clean rope. But it had to be clean. She was not going to hang herself on a dirty rope. But she couldn't find a clean rope. And by the time she had exhausted all ropes, ah, oh, it's gone. It's a bit like, Yen, you were saying, that it will go. And one of the things we're trying to say is, it will go. Okay. Don't know when, don't know how, but it will go. The sooner the better, and when it's over, we'll do something fun together. Because one of the characteristics of autism is a depression attack. It's an absolute deluge of negative emotion. Now, uh, on YouTube, there is an excellent series of videos by Maya Tode. She calls herself the Anne Mish. Maya is from Copenhagen in Denmark, and she has Asperger's. And the thing is, from the age of seven, she would have episodic depression, suicide attacks. What's the point of life? I'm going to hold my breath till I die. <clears throat> but anyway, the seeds were there from early on. Now, she developed a remarkable concept that I am now using and encouraging called energy accounting. This was designed for adults, but can also be used for teenagers. And the idea in energy accounting is that you have in your day the concept of that energy bank account 
that sometimes events will occur or people that you meet will drain you of energy. And in that draining of energy, you are going to become energy depleted. So there are energy withdrawals and energy deposits. There are things that will energize you. It can be Mr. Kitty, your cat, Mr. Kitty. Mr. Kitty is probably one of your fastest energizers and just being in his mere presence is enough. Knowing he exists is enough. Okay, so what we do is go through what may be potential energy withdrawals and deposits. This is the cheat sheet. These are the things that we found that withdraw energy, deplete you. Socializing. Yes, the person with autism can socialize, can be the life and soul of the party. Absolutely fantastic. But tomorrow, social migraine, under the covers, in the cupboard, that's it. I'm going to pay for this. It was so good. Coping with change, even if it's to a preferred activity. Too many changes. I have to use a lot of mental energy to recalibrate my mind to the same situation. And if my main way of socializing is to have a huge and rich memory store of social events that I can use to imitate and become the person in that situation. If I've never seen that situation before, if it's totally new, I have no idea what my role and script will be. Making a mistake, sensory sensitivity, daily living skills can drain you with energy. One of the major ways of energy draining is coping with anxiety. And for the kids, they use so much energy coping with anxiety at school, there's no energy left for the schoolwork. There can be overanalyzing social performance, analysis to paralysis, especially inhibiting sleep, sensitivity to other people's moods, being teased or excluded, crowds. Yeah, you don't have to interact with people, it's just lots of people around. Government agencies, Centrelink, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, body shape, uh, it can be perceived injustice. And as a psychologist, I say there is astronomical psychology and some people are emotional black holes <laughs> they suck away all your energy you are just with them <laughs> and it's gone and it never comes back <laughs> they suck away your energy keep away from them okay what are the deposits solitude but it takes time special interest is your fastest energy restorative physical activity animals and nature computer games, meditation, caring for others, yes. It can be nutrition, get rid of junk food, sleep, um, reading Harry Potter books, but I thought I want to put that in because it's one I like. Anyway, right. <laughs> um, mental health vacation day, that, okay, we're going to take a day off because I haven't got the energy to cope. Information on the internet, being with pets, and certain people are the sun. They have that ability to totally energize you. So in energy accounting, we have a currency, a numerical value, how much an activity is draining or refreshing from day to day, with an energy range from 1 to 100. So on some days, you may get socialising. Ah, oh, socialising was like 8. Today was a 20. Ah, oh, today, nine, no, 100. Today was 100. So what you're trying to do is balance the books between energy depletion and energy restoration. So we add a numerical value of debits or credits, and if needed, must schedule more energy-infusing activities into the next day or week. So we fight autism with autism. We're pedantic, and we have lists. So this is the list of withdrawals and deposits. So you may have on the left column, what is it that drains you of energy? Okay. Add it up, 20, 40, 60, 80, 20, total, 360. What were today's deposits, 20, 20, 30, 40, total, 240. Oh, dear. You can cope with that for a while, but as you are sinking, you'll reach a tipping point and you'll just go straight down into a depression. This is an illustration. It's a teenage girl, uh, Ellen. She's, I think, 15 at this stage. These are the things that debit her account. Being late to school. 10 to 40. When I ask the guys why, because everyone's looking at you. That's what drains me of energy. Crowds, 20 to 60. Now, mum being cranky, when I think <laughs> mum's upset with me, when she's snappy, 30 to 100. Now, when we analysed it further, 
Mum can be cranky with her Aspie brother, but it's nothing to do with her. But the mere fact that mum's cranky infects her a huge degree. Um, teachers being snappy, uh, premenstrual tension, 10 to 30. Friends not being nice to each other, 20 to 30. This was important. Friends' own problems, 20 to 90. Wow. Okay, then um, a few other things there. Team sport, 30 to 40. Okay, what tops her up? TV programs, Star Kids, um, Harry Potter, Doctor Who, Sherlock, and Tolkien. I like those because they can be great restoratives. Reading alone, 30 to 40. Dancing freestyle, gets home from school, goes into a bedroom, locks the door so her brother can't get in, cranks up the hi-fi, dances freestyle, 30 to 50. But down there is talking to boys, 10 to 30. Girls drain me, boys infuse me. Very important. Other components we're aware of can be substance abuse for teenagers and adults because if you don't manage your emotions in an effective way, you may discover there are alternative ways with alcohol and marijuana. Now, sometimes that substance abuse is, yes, for emotion management. It's to engage reality, to make you relaxed in a social setting, but then you don't do things by half, or to escape reality of a bubble of numbness and I don't care. So alcohol and marijuana is freely available in modern society. It's a social lubricant. It reduces social anxiety. But you also then become in a member of a group with clear rules, dress, language, codes of conduct, and it's a relaxant. So please, emotion, regulation, and management is important because if you don't, they may discover ways of achieving it that we do not recommend. Also, there can be a high level of anorexia nervosa and ASD. Research suggests that actually about one in four of those in eating disorder clinics have signs of an autism spectrum disorder. It's not always a disorder of body image. It can be issues of fascination with and association with diet, exercise, food rituals to prevent feelings of being out of control or to eliminate disabling anxiety or a special interest in nutrition and calories, which means that any psychotherapy that is for gender dysphoria, that anything that may be helping in terms of eating disorders, borderline, must be adjusted for the autistic mindset. Otherwise, it's going to cause huge amount of problems. Now, this slide was put in, Jeanette, before you decided to change your name to Yen. But do, does that web page still work? It does, and it works if you type in yenjurgis.com or jeanettejurgis.com because Barb cooks my web designer and she is awesome and she does magical things coding, so I don't have any of that. <laughs> <laughs> she does that for me too. <laughs> okay, uh, and talking of Barb Cook in a way, Barb Cook, uh, spectrumwomen.com, a place to go to be part of the tribe and understand each other. Another one, of course, is yellow. Uh, ladybugs, we promote this as best we can because it's the best. It really is good. It's amazing. Now, the National Autistic Society in London have a free course on girls and women on the autism spectrum. Uh, free until March, then you pay for it. But if you want to download, especially as a professional. Also, one of the topics that um, Yen mentioned is clinicians' knowledge of autism but especially girls and women. Now, Michelle and I are doing a masterclass in children and teenagers with ASD in diagnosis and treatment. We'll be returning to Melbourne, and we'll be there on Thursday and Friday, the 17th and 18th of October. And I think we have some uh, flyers there. But also, you may be interested that the day after, the Saturday, we're doing a whole day on girls and women in great detail. So, I think, hey, look at the timing of that, spot on, okay, thank you. Thank you.